Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back. I'd like to welcome and introduce again, Dr. Robert Murphy, Executive Director of the Havey Institute for Global Health and the John Philip Fair Professor of Infectious Diseases here at Northwestern Spineberg School of Medicine, who answers your COVID questions and addresses the latest COVID news every Tuesday and Thursday here on the Havey Institute for Global Health's Facebook page. And today, Dr. Murphy will be answering viewer submitted questions and addressing the latest COVID head headlines through today, the 1st of March. And we invite you to continue to submit your questions to us via Facebook at NU Institute for Global Health or by email at globalhealthinstitute at northwestern.edu. And leading the discussion again today is our student research assistant, Sophie Buskowski. So Sophie, I now turn it over to you. Thank you, Kristen. Hi, Dr. Murphy. Hey, good morning. Now for some updated COVID statistics. As of the last day of February, February 28th, 65.1% of the population in the United States has two doses, but only 28.5% are fully vaccinated. In the United States yesterday, we had 107,000 new positive cases. And while that has increased in the last couple of days, hospitalization and deaths have both decreased significantly. In Illinois, we saw yesterday 4,515 cases and both the death rate and hospitalization rate have both decreased. What can you tell us a little bit about what's going on with like this decrease in hospitalizations and deaths, but a little bit of an increase in cases? Yeah, it uh, as predicted, um, this huge Omicron peak that went up so fast, infected everybody that was at risk and they all got infected, and so it ended. And it, it worldwide, uh, they're seeing they saw it in South Africa, India. Um, they're on the upswing now in Hong Kong and uh, South Korea, which had kind of missed the first part of the Omicron wave. And we're seeing it here. So we're down in the tail part, um, and we'll see how far it goes. But like, for example, in Illinois, the new case rate is estimated to be 15 per 100,000, which is 100,000 population, and that's considered very low. Now, a lot of the new cases are not getting picked up because people are doing the home test, but really, the cases are down. There's just no question about it. So all that's great. And so now, all the, many of the mitigations uh, have, uh, the mandates have gone away. In other words, the, the laws are gone. So the companies uh, and the entities can do what they want. So on public transportation and the airports and everything, uh, the current government regulation goes till March 18th. Uh, and then that either has to be renewed or, or they'll abandon that too. Uh, that would be a big mistake. Um, but uh, you know, now, like for example, if you walk into a restaurant, some restaurants may still ask for your vaccine card. I would prefer to go to a restaurant that asked me that. Absolutely. Right, particular point. But some people, some restaurants in parts of the city or the suburbs or the state or wherever you are, you know, a lot of the people are not vaccinated and they won't go. Uh, so, you know, they're going to they're gonna give that up. So it's going to be a hodgepodge of stuff and it's up to everybody to do what they think best is for their company and people are, the population is gonna, going to do what they want to do. Right. Like for example, I want to go to restaurants that uh, ask for the vaccine card, All right? I'll find out which ones those are and I will go to those. Uh, if they're not asking for the vaccine card, I'm very hesitant. I mean, I hope this is the last wave, but we won't know. We won't know until the next 90 to 180 days. So. We'll see, but uh, things are definitely loosening up. And that's good because a lot of people don't need that um, at this particular point with the case rates down so low. But, you know, the same basic principles uh, aren't going away. This COVID is still here. Right. And a closed, confined space with a lot of people that increases your risk. Um, that doesn't change. Uh, so, you know, you have to make your own personal decision uh, what you want to do. If you are older or you have some underlying risk, you really have to be careful out there now because you're going to be in places where people are not wearing masks and you should continue to wear a mask in those places. Like when you go to the grocery store or something and hopefully 
there won't be any, any discrimination uh, for people who decide they need to wear a mask because there could be as many as 30% of the entire population. So um, I, I don't think that's going to be a big problem in uh, at least uh, the northern part of the state here. Uh, and uh, many areas, I think, too, uh, people will be respectful. Uh, that's all we're, all people can ask for at this particular point. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, that goes right into our next COVID headline of the fact that COVID-19 is killing more people than during most of the pandemic. Here's who's still at risk. You know, you mentioned about 30% of the population. What can you tell us about the people who are still at risk? Yeah, yeah. The... Uh, the problem is that that Omicron wave was so enormous. It was bigger than the Delta wave from the last spring, last winter. Those waves were nothing. The Omicron wave was enormous. Even that it causes less severe disease, there were so many more people infected that now we're paying the price uh, with this death. Because death, unfortunately, is... The, it's a horrible metric, but it's it's the last metric of the infectious process. Right. You get infected, you get exposed. You develop symptoms in a week. Your symptoms deteriorate if they're going to deteriorate a week or so later. You end up in the hospital. You're in the ho now the treatments in the hospital are great. People know how to care for it. Now the hospitals are not overwhelmed with patients anymore. You can pretty much get good care anywhere now, pretty much. And then, you, you know, we've, we can keep people alive now for a long time. ECMO, ventilators, all this uh, stuff with some of the anti-inflammatory treatments, steroids, all, you know, remdesivir, you know, Paxlovid, all this stuff. We can keep people alive for a long time. Uh, and so you see, unfortunately, a lot of them don't make it, especially if they have underlying conditions. And so that's why this, unfortunately, the death rate is still, you know, like five airplane crashes a day, you know, jumbo jets, you know. So it's, uh, it's still, unfortunately, uh, causing a lot of problems throughout the country. And it's very diffuse, you know, it's everywhere that this is happening. And uh, that's why it, it sort of has just become accepted, unfortunately. Now, which brings us back to how do you avoid that vaccination? Um, and unfortunately, not only have the cases gone down, but the people getting a new vaccination has gone down. Right. Um, this is due in two reasons. One is that the epidemic is kind of calmed down. People have been, ah, I don't need it, you know. Um, but the other thing is, is that the courts have, have blocked some of the mandates uh, for vaccinating people and, uh, and, and mask wearing, as everybody knows. So they, the courts took a little shift uh, a couple months ago. Uh, and I think those two things combined have uh, decreased the interest for vaccination. To put it into perspective globally, the United States of our peer high-income countries is the least vaccinated country. We have the most COVID. We have the most deaths we have one of the highest case rates. Of the big European countries and peer countries, we're still number one. And we have a relatively high death rate, 1.2%, uh, compared to many of the European countries, um, which range from 0.2% in uh, Norway and Denmark, 0.6% in France, I think it's 0.8% in Spain. Um, we have a high death rate too. So um, it, you know, this is not over. Uh, and at this point, you know, we're going to have to live with this thing, whether it becomes endemic or when it becomes endemic is the big question. Um, but the thing that will keep you most likely, <coughs> excuse me, to keep you out of the hospital and keep you alive is to be vaccinated and boosted. Yeah, absolutely. That also goes right into our next headline of the new COVID, vac like COVID vaccination has been dropping yeah. in the U.S. as cases and hospitalizations are also declining. Mm -hmm. What can you tell us about, you know, you mentioned this just now that yeah. the, the U.S. numbers are so low in vaccination rate. What can yeah. you tell us about this correlation? Yeah, no, it's, it's a basic, I, I just answered it already um, because all these, all these questions actually, you know, I mean, they're all ending up in the same place. 
numbers are going down, hospitalization rate relatively flat, uh, or the hospitalization rate coming down, but the death rate is relatively flat, um, still unacceptably high. And, um, you know, it's explained mostly by unvaccinated, but not, not completely. Um, you know, people with a lot of high risks uh, that get COVID, even if they're vaccinated, they can get very sick and they can die. So this is the whole thing why we have to be careful uh, right. as we loosen these mitigations up. We don't want to get them, throw them under the bus, basically. We don't, we want, don't want to get those people sick because they can really, really get sick and die. No, absolutely. And for our last big COVID headline, Illinois ended its indoor mask mandate. Here's what it means for schools, restaurants, and more in Chicago and the suburbs. What can you tell us about what happened yesterday, which was a huge event um, in the United States? Yeah, big, big happening everywhere. Yeah. Um, now, the mandate is gone. That doesn't mean masks are going away, because it depends. It depends. It's up to the company or the entity or wherever, who's ever letting you in. Remember, going indoors in a crowded space is still a risk for coronavirus infection. So, um, you know, it, uh, you, you may still see signs that say mask, you have to wear a mask to come in. Um, they can do that. That is legal. Um, nobody says that you can't do that anymore. Uh, not in Illinois, oh, anyway, or most of, most of the states. So it's, it's really up to the place. There's a few states that have banned mask mandates. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, that's just counterproductive, but it puts a lot of people at risk. But, you know, particularly for our um, elderly population and for people who have underlying diseases, puts them at high risk for getting sick, you know, what you want to still get a mask. And when you go indoors, you want to be careful. <clears throat> Absolutely. And now for some COVID questions. Um, this individual's daughter is fully vaccinated, has a booster. She has a three-year-old and a one-year-old month baby. Their husband, like this individual's husband and I, are fully vaccinated, received their booster, but their adult son who received J&J &J and had COVID back in October, 2021, would like to visit her family, but he refuses to get his booster. Should he isolate before visiting them? How long should he isolate? Should he visit them at all, Dr. Murphy? Well, <clears throat> I think the easier thing for this person to do, uh, this adult son who refuses a booster shot, uh, is to just get a, a molecular test um, the day before he's supposed to come. I would do the molecular test um, because it's more sensitive in people who don't have symptoms. We're assuming he doesn't have any symptoms. If he has any symptoms, he can do one of the over-the-counter antigen tests. But he could get a molecular test and go and forget all the isolation stuff. Basically, how it how we handle international travel. Okay, wonderful. Mm -hmm. And now for a second COVID question. This individual's wife received and themselves received a COVID booster six months ago, mm -hmm. Pfizer. This individual is 75 years old and, and his wife is in his late 60s. One is a little overweight and one is a little bit, a lot overweight. Uh, neither of them have chronic health issues. They're concerned they are going to be in like high risk now with the mask mandate being removed. What can you tell us about if they should get another booster? Okay, the, these people have two high risk factors. They're overweight and they're over 65 years of age. So that's two. Now, do they also have hypertension? Do they also have adult onset diabetes? You know, do they have other medical problems? If they do, it just makes their risk even higher. <clears throat> I'm afraid though, uh, so they need to be careful where they go, wear masks. It does give you some protection even if the other people are not wearing it. Be very careful where you go. This is, this is the part of the 30% of the people that are, have some kind of risk factor. As far as getting another booster shot, it's not approved. Um, and the reason it's not approved is uh, there's some question whether it really helps. We don't know. Um, the Israelis think it does. And uh, they approved it, I think, for over 60 years of age, <clears throat> a fourth shot. Sweden has just approved it in people over 80. And the reason why these countries did that is because all, this, all of a sudden all these vaccinated boosted people were ending up in the hospital, some getting sick and some dying. Uh, and so they put the, the fourth shot in place, the second booster. 
So we're not really sure if it's needed. Uh, and it's not approved in the United States, so you can't even get it if you wanted it. Um, but <clears throat> you certainly do have to be careful uh, with the risk factors, like I mentioned. Yeah, absolutely. Now for a third COVID and last question. This individual has been receiving COVID-19 treatment since the beginning of January. They came home for treatment a couple of days ago and ended up back in at Northwestern. Mm -hmm. They're a long hauler and they have other autoimmune diseases. Can you explain to people what a long hauler is slash what long COVID is, secondary infections after COVID? They're vaccinated and they're boosted and people don't understand that you can receive complications from getting COVID. I'm not sure if this, it's a little bit semantics here. I'm not sure if this person really qualifies as a long hauler or they're still suffering from their first bout of COVID because they've got underlying um, immune, some immune complex disease, uh, and they've been in the hospital, they've been very sick, went home, relapsed, came back. It's, um, but it, you know, they have more symptoms. And I think this person really hit the nail on the head here. Um, you know, this is a serious disease. Um, if you've got underlying uh, immunocompromised condition, you know, you've had cancer, you've got, a, an immun you've got some kind of uh, immunologic uh, disease or, or whatever, um, you can, you, you're at risk for all sorts of complications. Now, say he or she recovers completely, goes home, and then still has some kind of symptoms like fatigue, muscle weakness, like cloudiness in the brain, they call brain fog. You know, after three months or even six months, the Kaiser Family Foundation has studied this in, in their database, they have this huge database, they said 14% of people were still seeing, seeking medical care for complications from their COVID from six months ago, 14%. Um, there's many other studies that have looked at this. So it's somewhere between 10 and 20% uh, are having some kind of complication out to six months or longer. So fortunately, most of them seem to get better over time, but you know, there's no guarantee and we're still learning. But uh, I, I totally agree with this person that, you know, we've got to really be careful with this disease. It, not only can it be lethal, but it can lead to long-term complications that can be very debilitating, um, particularly in people who've got some underlying disease. No, absolutely. And those were all of our COVID questions for today. Thank you, Dr. Murphy. Well, thank you. Have a good morning.